Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage podcast with Greg Gregory. Join us as Greg interviews powerful thought leaders and successful team and leadership experts from across the country on teamwork, leadership, and organizational culture. Now let's check in for this week's episode. Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage, where teamwork is really an advantage to any organization. We stop to think, it's what we do together. Wilma Rudolph said, regardless of what you do in life, someone else helps you. Those are the powerful words of great people. We want to talk today about teamwork, leadership, and culture. And we're excited right now as we are well into our 100 episodes, and really getting some great guests. And joining us today is absolutely no stranger to understanding communication, teamwork, collaboration all across the board. His career spans over 30 years in conflict prevention, okay, as well as leadership, stress management, communication. He's highly sought after as a facilitator, as a coach for individuals, as well as corporations, government agencies, and nonprofits worldwide. As the founder of Weston Network and the nonprofit Pierce Civility Project, which we're going to talk about that book, his clients include NASA, the World Bank, Oxfam, Booz Allen, Hamilton, PBS, the National Cancer Institute, the United Nations, I think we understand where that goes, as well as Mitsubishi Motors. His first book came out in 2011 called Mastering Respectful Confrontation, and it's been sold worldwide. His second book, Fierce Civility, Transforming Our Global Culture from Polarization to Lasting Peace, was released in early March of 2023. Now, it's an Amazon bestseller in 14 categories, He's also served as an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. A whole lot of credentials that we go here. He's also worked on the program of conflict resolution, as well as veterans groups, organizations, integration. He taught, this one intrigues me a little bit here, Joe. Meditation and leadership to inmates. Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage, Joe Weston. Thank you. It's so great to be here, Greg. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited because some of the things you and I have talked offline a couple of times, and one of the things, if we go, if listeners will go back and listen to an episode from a little over a year ago with Sean Buck, at the time the superintendent at the Naval Academy, he said, what we're missing in today's world is civility. Okay, and then next thing you know, you and I connect, and you're all about fierce civility. And so I wanted to chat about how that comes together. But before we get into where you are today and your new book, or even your old book, how did you get here? You know, you didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to write a book on all this stuff. You know, it's like I tease. I said, I, I teach teamwork, but I'm an only child. So go figure that one. So how did you get there? Well, if I'm going to use my really bad humor, I would say, how did I get here? The subway. No, just kidding. <laughs> how did I get here? You know, I say it always starts. It does. You know, I talk about the subway. It starts with my journey being born in New York City. And people often ask me, Joe, why are you so attracted to conflict and confrontation and all of those, you know, those kind of themes in a sense? And I say, well, you know, growing, it's like growing up in New York City is my, my greatest teacher. That's where you really, every day is an examination of confrontation and conflict. And I mean that in the best sense of the world. It's the best sense of, the, of, the, of that idea that being in New York, you're constantly bombarded by strangers and you have to learn how to navigate space and, and how to navigate challenges. And I also had a pretty challenging childhood, which included my dad being in jail when I was around 12 years old. So I understand violence and aggression. And so I've always been observing. And one of the fundamental questions I've always had, even as a kid, in fact, got me through a lot of what I experienced as a kid was, why is it, even though we know better, we still have arguments and fights? That we're a relatively intelligent species and we have all the information we need and we have major techn technological advances, why can't we figure this one out of arguments and fights or crime and war or hunger? And, and you know, most people would say that's just the way we are, but I was never satisfied with that answer. So my life has, my whole life has been an examination of that. And I was very lucky as a young man to start studying Tai Chi. Someone once said to me, Joe, you really need to meditate. And I said, oh, I couldn't possibly sit for that long. And he <laughs> said, what about Tai Chi? That's like meditation in motion. And that transformed my life, Greg. I got to understand mind-body connection. I got to understand how systems work, internal systems, external systems, 
how to deal with other people's force without, you know, what it means to come into someone's space, aggression, assertiveness, what brute force is as opposed to true power. And these are all elements that I brought into the work I did. And I was, I ended up in the Netherlands. I lived there for 18 years and that's where I started doing corporate trainings, mostly around dealing with aggression. I got to go around the world to do that with leadership, management, customer service. And so based on the martial arts work and the communications work, I created a system, first respectful confrontation and now fear civility, which helps us understand how we are engaging with others, what it means to bring in our power without overpowering others, what it means to invite someone else into their true power. And that for me, as, as we've discussed, is the basis of good leadership and creating really vibrant, thriving teams. When we think about that, I, my mind goes to one of the biggest reasons people leave an organization is because of the relationship they have with their colleague, coworker, or even their manager. And, and that probably stems from some form of confrontation or something not being done correctly or confrontation not being handled correctly. Is that, is that a fair assumption? Yeah, I would say that that's true. You know, one of the, it was very interesting. I, wor I worked for NASA for about 12 years and I would do my respectful confrontation training. And, you know, at the end of every workshop I gave or training I gave, I would always ask the participants, what, you know, how is this workshop for you? What are you taking away? And the number one thing that I heard from people was, I never expected that the problem I was having with my colleague, that I'm contributing a little bit to that problem. And to me, that's huge. If people can just get that, that right. in every challenge you have, that you have to be contributing something. It may not be a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's a lot of the work too, is, is basically, you know, you know, I talk about chronic niceness, how I, I was invited to come into an organization because they were just about at the point of bankruptcy, uh, going bankrupt because of gossip. And that was a culture of chronic niceness where they were all really nice to each other, but how they were treating each other behind the scenes was just awful. And it was, and it basically, as you would, as you know, this it eroded the integrity of the collaborations. So the, the essence of my work is recognizing very clearly that just being nice is not going to create successful teams. In fact, it could tear them down. We yes. have to have the skills and the courage to speak our truth, stand in our power, get our needs met in a way where we don't harm others and, and, and we don't get harmed. Yeah, it's, it's really wild because I've read several places and I've talked about it. One of the reasons leaders fail is they avoid the confrontation, i.e. the niceness factor. Yeah. So when we stop to think about that, what are some of the essential traits, characteristics that leaders really should have you know, especially as they start to navigate in these high stress environments. Because today they're, they're leading people in person, remotely, maybe all remotely, maybe it's all over the place and how they're leading. So when we're doing that, what are some traits these leaders need to have so that they're not becoming aggressive, but not yeah. being passive? That's a beautiful question. You know, I start with a fundamental thing and, and this is trending. It's, and it's been trending now for quite a while that now in the 21st century and at the moment, what's being expected of leaders is to be able to function from a place of vulnerability and transparency. And as you know, the work is really helping people understand that there is power in vulnerability. One of the fundamental concepts or philosophies that I work with is that it's in your vulnerability that your true power is revealed. And that people, people, you know, you know, you can't BS a BSer, right? So I, I come from a long line of BSer. People can see integrity or not, and people can see through it. So if you want to keep people, if you want to inspire people, get more buy-in, they need to see that you're authentic, and and that the work is helping people understand, it, and not just theory, right? So because my work is based on martial arts and now neuroscience and somatic work. That's the work I did at Georgetown was to teach stress management and how to overcome trauma. There's a lot of emphasis now on trauma-informed leadership. That's all the basis of what I do. The basis of, uh, for a leader is to uh, begin from a place of vulnerability, to feel in your body that there's power in that. It's inspiring. It encourages others to show up more authentically. 
And by doing that, you create a culture of safety and trust. And that at this moment, ding, if you ding, want ding, to... ding, 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 yeah. that's our yeah. word, baby. That's Ooh. our word. Vulnerability and trust go together. And it's not, it's kind of almost, it's, it's aggressive to expect people to take risks or show up fully if you're, if you're not creating that safety and trust. And in fact, in the end, you save a lot of time and energy by instead of just trying to push people or teaching people or constantly getting on people to be their best selves, you, if you stop doing that and you just work on creating a, a stronger culture of safety and trust, then the, the, each individual will show up in a much more empowered way and there'll be more buy-in. It goes back to a lot of Maslow's theory, too, when you start to pick on to that, because you have to create an environment right at the beginning where people feel safe. And most people think that's more from a physical standpoint, but it's much more important from an emotional standpoint in the workplace today. Yeah. Yes. And now you're getting a much more a d diverse work culture. So it's the leader's job to take some time to be more curious and compassionate for other people's backgrounds or or needs. And that doesn't mean you have to completely, you don't have to believe what other people believe, but that if you want to be economical in your time and energy, taking the time to create that inclusive work environment is really key. And I talk a lot about that. And, and I am the first to say that the more inclusive your work environment is, the more you must build in respectful structures of accountability. You must. That, and I think that's where a lot of organizations are are failing at the moment is that, you know, because the hierarchical structure, you know that from the military, right? So having worked with a lot of combat veterans and understanding that, you know, when you're in a hierarchical system, there are disadvantages of that in terms of personal freedom and, and expression. The, the, the benefit of it is that there's a built-in accountability system. You either show mm -hmm. up and put up or put out. Or you're whatever. AWOL. Or you're AWOL. Yeah, exactly. And, but when you take that away and you're creating what I call more a circular leadership model, it, you create the opportunity for people to show up, bring in their creativity, and that's more inclusive, but you're missing the accountability system. So time and energy must be placed on coming up with clear structures for accountability. You used the word a moment ago about accountability. You used the word respectful accountability. Yeah. And you kind of go into what you mean by that. What I mean by that is that, and that's where the respectful confrontation work comes in and the fear civility work comes in. Because you can, you can have, you can create a system of accountability and you can, and, and the, because there aren't structures that set it up, it means that every individual is responsible for holding themselves accountable and holding others accountable. And if you don't have skills and a vocabulary to hold someone else accountable, then you're probably just going to criticize them, diminish them, judge them and disempower them in a sense. Yeah. So in a sense, the skills have to be built to be able to have difficult conversations with them. If you're holding someone accountable, they're not gonna wanna hear it. It's, it's, it's gonna be uncomfortable for them. They're gonna try to avoid it and no one wants to hear that they're not perfect, right? <laughs> We're not. <laughs> except for you, except for you. So when, when someone ha says, okay, I'm gonna have a confrontation, I'm gonna confront you, in my system, it's coming from a place of respect to be able to say, because in a sense, what you're saying is that if I hold you accountable, then I am holding you in your highest, right? And that's, I see a lot of leaders do that too, where they have employees and they're just like, oh, they're just not good. I'll do the work for them. And that's just disrespectful and disempowering them. But to be able to say, I have faith in you, I believe in you, and I know you to be better than this, then having that conversation empowers them and it all begins let's go backwards a little bit to vulnerability trust yeah if they've built that vulnerability trust and the person feels they've been heard through the team then when someone is giving them accountability feedback they don't take it personally they understand what they need to do right Ideally, right? You know, their first initial response ideal. is it's ideal. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's going to be defensive, like, because we're just humans, right? And a lot of the work that I do, because it's somatic based, because it's like 
martial arts training is that is to just understand that I, I t- in terms of we're talking about vulnerability and trust and safety is an important. And, and as you said, um, it's not just uh, physical safety, but the, that what's important in the work that, that I like to bring across is this idea that every difficult conversation is going to be uncomfortable. Growth is uncomfortable, right? Mm-hmm. Taking risks are uncomfortable. But if you have trauma in your system, or if you have chronic stress or compounded stress, and Greg, I don't think there's anyone on this planet at this time who doesn't have some level of chronic stress or trauma. Where does all levels are at an all-time high? All-time high, yes, just getting through the day. So if you already have that in your system, then your system can't tell the difference anymore between uncomfortable and unsafe. So that's why even a respectful conference, even a, com- a, a a conversation about building someone's capacity, while it's very uncomfortable, if they can't tell the difference, they're going to perceive it as unsafe and they're going to go into a fight, flight, freeze response like it's a hungry tiger, right? That's yeah. the, yeah. Yeah, the amygdala gets stripped. Yeah. 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 And that that's that's critical. And the training and, and the work is to help people slow down get a deeper relationship with their own nervous system so that when someone says, hey, I, I need to give you some feedback, of course, your first initial response is going to be fight, flight, freeze. But if, but what if you have the skills to then get regulated again, get open again and realize, okay, I'm going to just trust that what their purpose of this isn't to tear me down, but to empower me. Okay. Then, you, then it can be a much more effective conversation and you can get through it more quickly and move on and continue the process. So can you give us a couple of ideas on how I can sit down and say, okay, I know the deep breathing, I know take my time, uh, that kind of stuff to try and release myself. What are some tricks that I can do to, when somebody says, I need to give you some feedback and not get upset? <laughs> well, I, I don't know, about, it's a, I guess it's not about getting upset, I think, but I, I think that's it. I well. I would say what it starts with is, yeah, is, is regulating the nervous system. And and I do a, a very quick exercise with people that I actually developed working with the combat veterans who, who were saying that, you know, what can you do to help when I go into a flashback where I get triggered by something and I, I've lost time and space in a sense. And the practice is to train yourself to feel your feet on the ground, focus in your center, in your core, in your lower belly, connect with your heart and take deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. And that if you do that, feet on the ground, focus in my center, connect with my heart, take deep breaths, you'll find that you'll activate the parasympathetic nervous system, right? But when you're in that fight, flight, freeze response, the sympathetic nervous system is overactive. Right. And that the body wants to find balance and that the the beauty of the human body is that it's built in. If the sympathetic nervous system is activated, we have to find ways to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which activates different hormones to bring us back to balance. And that exercise does that. So that's the first step. And, okay. I, and the second, the next thing to keep in mind is the importance of impact and influence in creating safety and trust. The more present I am, the more impact I'm going to have, the more I can truly connect with authentic connection, without a telephone going, without the computer, without being distracted, but truly heart-to-heart connection, mm-hmm. that's already going to lower the misunderstandings and the miscommunication and the, and, the, and the reactive nature. So regulate the nervous system, presence and connection to increase impact and influence. And that the key of the work, the, the actual breakdown of the strategy to have a difficult conversation is how do I help the other person to be as receptive to hear this, knowing that they're not going to want to hear this? And, and in terms of team building, if everyone buys into a system of holding each other accountable and, and that they see that confrontation is actually a beneficial thing to deepen relationship, then that will also shift it. That if someone says, hey, if I say, Greg, hey, I want to I wanna confront you on something, I want to give you feedback, that you might, you cycle through all those feelings and you say, well, now I remember that we've all agreed that we're going to have the difficult conversations because in a sense, he's there to support me. I recently watched the movie Apollo 13. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of scenes in there where exactly what you're talking about just took place. 
you know, when they're in there, everything's starting to go wrong and how the three astronauts were able to pull that together. So yeah. but that's, that's absolutely critical to what we're looking at. Yeah. And, and doing that on ourselves, and there's an expression, our listeners have heard me say this plenty of times before, I call it the Abe effect, and that is awareness brings effectiveness. And when you are aware of your feelings when somebody says that to you, and you are aware of what you are doing with somebody else, then that will allow us to become more effective. Yeah. The question now, I'm going to turn the tables. He, you said how I could, we were talking about how I can do it when I'm going to receive that with those words. What can I do? Because so often today we are in a boom, 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 boom society. What can I do when I know I have to meet with somebody? And I'm not thinking, it is, I'm, I'm thinking in my head, hey, I just want to give him a little feedback. This is going to be good. It's going to help. But what can I do to make sure I'm not tripper, tripping their amygdala, if you will, and sending them into that state? Yeah, you, you got to be. You got to be prepared. You got to be prepared with facts, right? And and you know, and, and I'm sure you. I'm sure you know this. Mm -hmm. You know, when you well, the first thing you want to do is make sure you're regulated. You want to make sure you're centered, and you want to give that person the benefit of the doubt. So I think that's key. So so you know, and, and so it's making sure you're regulated. The next thing is meet the person where they are. So that 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 means activating curiosity and compassion. Are it's, you saying meet them where they are physically, emotionally? Where? How do you mean there? Well, yeah, it's better to do it face to face. So yeah, uh, if you can to do it to literally, but I mean more metaphorically, like uh, just meet them where they are. Again, to uh, so to activate curiosity and to activate compassion. The starting point being um, giving them the benefit of the doubt. One of the, another important philosophy in this work. If you want to get to win-win, right? If you want to, you know, and this I bring up a lot in fear civility. The reason why we're in such a polarized state, and why we're we're having trouble relating, and we can, and there seems to be so much separation and antagonism, has to do with a lot of our own internal polarizations and beliefs that we have, and we're not even aware we have them. And the first one is, I'm right, and if you have a different viewpoint, you must be wrong. The second one is, I'm all good. I'm the good guy here, and you're all bad if you're if you're my if you're my opponent. And the third one is, I want to win, and if you're my opponent, you have to lose. And you know, you can say, and that's why I think it's interesting. People might say, Oh no, I'm really civilized. I don't have that. But when it comes down to it and you're activated, you'll find that these patterns come up a lot. And so in and terms of the more pressure of it is, you start you change it. Yeah, the more pressure it is, yeah, all that 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 work you've done has got out the window and you're back into I gotta win and I gotta be right. So that's the idea of meeting them where they are, is to try to let go of this idea of my truth does not equal the truth. I can't know everything. Really? I can't. Maybe you can, but I can. I'm, I'm humble enough to be able to say everybody. If anybody thinks they know it all, they're crazy, of course. Well, they're crazy, or they're not, and they're not a good leader. There are leaders who do believe that, right? And there are there are people that do. I shouldn't say right, but that's that's. I think there are people, and and again, people might say, "Oh, I don't do that. I know I don't know anything." But as soon as they're in a heated situation, they go right back into, "No, the way I saw it is the way it is." Yeah. And I think that's so. So the starting point is to let go of this idea, because then the quest, the, the remedies for that, or what I call the pivots, is: Do I want to be right, or do I want to be effective? Do I, I want to win? Hmm? Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just, do I want to win or do I want to have collaborative buy-in? So those, those that that's how the starting point of of how to go into those conversations. I saw a post some time ago that said it's more important for the leader to be right at the end of the meeting than at the beginning of the meeting. Okay, <laughs> and that's bringing it in. Of course, I go back. You've talked about win-win. That goes all the way back. To that. Got it here somewhere. I think it's, it's on the other side here. Dr. Covey's Seven Habits. And of course, thinking win win is one of his habits. And it's about having a concern for yourself, yes. It's also about having concern for the other individual. And we've got to get that both in the high category so that I'm thinking about you 
but I'm not letting myself down because I don't want to let myself go either. I don't want to be a lose win situation. Right. And you know, and what do you accomplish in teamwork if you if you if there needs to be a winner and a loser? Right. You know, you can have situate because I I have I believe in the fundamental belief of benevolent competition. Oh, absolutely. Right, right, right. Competition absolutely. is necessary. We need to develop, we need competition. We need to be put in those challenges, but they don't have to be um, set up that there has to be a loser because you know this, right? If, if, if we are in competition, if we're playing a game or sport or something like that and you win, I should be able to feel all the feelings like bummer I lost, but then do an after action report and say, why didn't I win this time? Mm -hmm. and gather information and then integrate that new information so the next time we're in that situation, I might win. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, I can't be a loser. I'm always, we're, there's always a winner. Mm -hmm. I've won because- Sports teams are great at that with their debrief after a game on Sunday for football or amazing, the way event planners are incredible at that when they start to do it, what worked, what didn't work. Right. It makes sense, it's common sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so in a sense, that's the culture of um, mutual empowerment that I talk about, the basis of my work and creating a uh, culture of benevolent competition. I want to go here because this is something that I thought about for a while. And we're both kind of in the realm of teamwork. But when we look at people in government agencies, not-for-profit, okay, corporate, huge corporations, entrepreneurs, small businesses, medium businesses, military. How do things change between all of these as far as what you're teaching? Does it change and how do you address it? Well, I, I think it is changing. I think just the trend of generations, I think, you know, what, what, what you and I um, put up with <laughs> or, or accept <laughs> You know, young people now in their 20s and 30s just don't accept it. I'm not, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that they're, they're all, sorry, it's different. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. So I, you know, and I, so there, I think there, that's where a shift is happening. And, I, and, and for me, there's always the balance. You know, I think that, you know, we come, I'll speak for myself. We come from a, a period where you, you were rewarded if you, if you suffered, right? If you were burnt out. I remember I was doing some work in Japan and, and one of the, Japanese executives came to me and said, oh, Joe, you look really tired. And my American self was like, what? He just insulted me. And then another half Japanese, half American colleague said, oh, no, Joe, that's the best compliment you can get from a Japanese business person, that you look tired, right? So that's a generation. I think younger people are coming from a different place. And I would feel, let's find the balance. But the different industries, I mean, between government, military, private sector, not-for-profit, how do your methods change in teaching the civility, the communication, and the leadership and teamwork? How does that all change? I think that the key is uh, understanding interdependence. Because if you think of it, any leader, they may function from a place of, I have uh, authority and, and, I, and I dictate everything, but they wouldn't be successful without all the people working around them. And, and in the military, you know, one of the greatest honors I've had is to work with combat soldiers and if there's anyone who understands true camaraderie, true brotherhood or sisterhood, it's, it's someone who's seen battle. They fundamentally understand that they, couldn't, they would not have survived if they didn't have that level of camaraderie. And that's why I believe, and I think we've spoken about that, that I think the, this country and the world would be a better place if more veterans were able to take all of their experience and learnings and transform that into the private sector, we would have incredible leaders because they understand what teamwork really is. So I would say that you have to adapt it to the different sectors, but helping leaders understand that the interdependence, that they cannot function on an island, may help them relax more into this idea, how can I create more cultures of uh, mutual empowerment? Brought up Tai Chi or and meditation. Yeah. I had a roommate in college, he's really into Tai Chi, and we're talking 40 some years ago. I know Michelle. I'm just kind of like, oh, how do you get it? I've learned a little bit more about it. But when we stop to think about that meditation, how, 
how did you take that meditation, Tai Chi, self centered to working with inmates in the prison? An interesting point. And let's also tie it in with veterans because veterans have had their, their challenges with the PTSDs and all that we were just talking about. Yeah. You know, I, 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 it has to do with um, cultivating a deeper level of listening, um, going within. And, you know, and, and connecting mind and body. And, you know, a lot of the work comes from your core and your lower belly and, and learning how to move from there and understanding presence. You know, one of the, I, I work a lot with training people to cultivate a certain level of resilience. And my definition, one of my definitions of resilience is presence, awareness, balance, and flow. You know, when you talk about A, right, you're talking about the awareness piece, right? So, so to, to, that you are, you can find flow in all that you're doing in collaboration and yourself in thriving, creating a culture of thriving when you can train yourself to be in presence, awareness, and a constant calibration of balance and flow, especially with when obstacles come up. So, you know, in terms of working with the inmates, it was training them just to understand their reactivity. A lot of them wanted to know about how to manage their anger, right? So, and getting them skills about that, you know, to start shifting that obstacles and conflicts can be seen as moments of growth. Yeah, and I, and I bring in the heart, right? So, so it's about getting out of your head, which creates the separation and connect and then dropping into your core, which gets you more into movement. And then the middle point is the heart. And that's the basis of the work is that, you know, to, to be able to activate the best qualities of the heart, which is compassion and respect and connection. That's fascinating when I think about it. And I sit here trying to think how I can do that. So do you have a little secret trick strategy to help an individual who's never really sat there and tried to connect their mind body with this. Yeah. I'm, the breathing, I, I'm, saying, I'm talking about beyond the breathing. Do you have any tricks on that? Well, it, again, it starts with that self-regulation technique of feet on the ground, focus in your center, connect with your heart and take deep breaths. And then I would say you're really feeling into you know, you know, I guess I would say the tricks in that would be, as I'm sure you know, you've done a lot of work around the iceberg model, right? Of understanding the communication and inter, 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 inter communication right. and, and relationship that the 10% is what you see on the surface. And to, again, activate the compassion and curiosity to say that that person, there's more to that person than I can possibly see. And yeah, at the same bring time, it back to awareness. bring it back to awareness and, and, and to connect with your own 90%. And uh, humor, humor is a big one. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> and self-deprecating, I put up there is the highest part of that, being able to laugh at yourself a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit from your, your first book was out in 2011, so several years ago. Yeah. And that was called Mastering Respectful Confrontation. Today, it's fierce civility, transforming a global cult. So mastering a confrontation, you kind of hit on a little bit right now, I think, today. Yes. But when we look at the fierce civility, how do we transform our cult with the T? When I've got a group of people who have been thrown together or even in a merger and acquisition of compartments of type situation, when you got that, there's always, going back to the Tuckman uh, safety in the 760s, the form, storm, norm, and deform. You go back to that, there's that stormy phase. So how does fear civility, what can be done there, really cement that and pull that to you together? I, I think it's a, acknowledging that we're, is, it, it's, the peer civility is more dealing with the question that you brought up about, you know, that what's, that what's important is civility. And everyone has their own definition of what civility is. And, and, you know, it could start with establishing a 
core set of values, right? Or a set of core values where, you know, we may, we, we may look different. We may have different beliefs. We may, we may see things different on different levels. We may have different political views, but where can we find commonality? Where can we find common ground? And that's the basis of the safety and trust. And how can we reinforce that and always come back to that? What's our common mission? And then the, the challenge, and I always say the exciting part is to acknowledge where we're different and see how we can actually take the best of our differences, go through that messy creative process so that something new emerges. And that the most vibrant work team is gonna be the most diverse. And it doesn't have to be diverse in terms of race or, or culture or religion, but diverse by how, you know, different worldviews because you're going to create something that doesn't exist yet, right? One of the fundamental things I say in, in pretty much all the work I do also in terms of society and the challenges we're having in society, if only hanging out with people who already agree with you were going to solve our world problems, we would have already solved our world problems, right? So, and we, and that's what we're doing. One, things I, one thing I try to help people remember in terms of how polarized we are now and how separate we are now is that it wasn't always like that. There was a time when we were able to gather in public places where we could be different and still collaborate and still treat each other with a basic respect. So because it's happened before, we can get back to it. And that what's, what is needed from us, and that's my desire with fear civility is to appeal to people's hearts and minds is for those of us who aren't on the extremes of the polarization to get more active. And I'm not talking political extremes. I'm talking the ones who, you know, the ones who aren't making as much noise. It's the ones on the extremes that are making a lot of noise and getting most of the attention. And we think that they're more powerful than they really are because they're getting, the media loves it, right? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. They profit from it. And there's not a lot of time and attention spent on the majority of people who may say, yes, I, I have my own beliefs and I don't, I don't want you to tell me I need to change them. However, even though you have different beliefs, I'm still willing to come to consensus in how we treat one another. And that to me is, is the key right now is to, is to, is to seek uh, alliances with people who do hold different views. Right. I mean, it's, it's so powerful when we start to think about it. It goes back thousands of years, some of the folks that have been able to be over the years, even at some of the great leaders, how they're able to pull people together by working at different classes, working with different ethnicity. What are you about them? And that's, that's absolutely powerful when you think of it. Yeah, and, and I think as a leader, I'm sorry, when you go into an organization and work with we, what's the first thing you get inside them? What's the first thing that they, you feel they need we to be able to create that civility process where they go? So, you know, in the work I do with the Western Network, creating cultures of mutual empowerment, it's about creating cultures of thriving. And, you know, if an organization calls me in, uh, I'm, a, I'm going to assume that they're not thriving. <laughs> Right? That's your work too, Greg. If they were already functioning well, they wouldn't need us on a certain level. So they're calling us in because there are some issues. So, so the, I, I start with a, a consultancy tool that's very simple that I actually borrowed, again, from Eastern philosophies, kind of like uh, my chi practice and, and Chinese medicine almost, is that if an, the, the, and I treat a company or an organiz, organization like an organism. So whether it's you or whether it's a family system or a neighborhood or whether it's an organization, if you see it as an organism, the question is, is the organization, is the organism well or not well? And if it's not well, that means somewhere it's out of balance. So the way to get to thriving is to first do an assessment and say, where is the system out of balance? And that um, the first step is to restore the, restore balance. And that can take time. Because that means if it's at, you know, what's keeping it out of balance and what do you need to do to repair? Once you've restored balance, you then move on to maintaining stability. 
And when you can get a system that's resilient enough to can always come back to balance, to restore balance and maintain a certain level of stability, it's created a foundation where each individual and all teams can thrive. Stability and balance, FGE. I mean, maybe that's a beautiful way to define civility is that what brings us back to a certain level of balance and respect. Oh, I'm learning all about balance. Um, recently I had a knee replacement surgery, so the other teaching me how to get balance back in my life. <laughs> yeah. Your whole system is out of balance, right? And it's, it's, it, there are different parts of your body that are fighting to, to, to try to deal with the, what caused the out of balanceness. We've got to think back. What, look for the commonalities. That's one thing I've taken from our talk today is to look for the commonalities in somebody else. Uh, what you got in common, what you could possess together, and don't focus on what you don't. Yeah, you start to pull it together. That way, people will start to respect each other. And as we start to respect, that goes back to the aspect of respectful power. We've got yeah. to have it. So we, we cover things we've got to have. But well, how we start to be respectful of that will lead to the civility of the environment of which, which means that each person's being honored, respected, and respected for who they are. And, and, and you know this from teams. If someone feels that they are valued and that their contribution matters, then they're going to thrive. They're going to hang around. They're not going to look for another job, right? They're going to, and, and they're not going to burn out. That, that's a key thing. When teamwork thrives like that, and it is flipping, the turnover rate in organization drops drastically. And yes. I think that's what's missing in a lot of people. Leaders. leaders don't realize. And they come in sometimes to make a change, and that change disrupts the other part of you, at least my father's mm -hmm. old saying. Yep. So you've got to keep that civility going. If Phil Cole, you hold you, what's the best way to do it? My website is uh, joeweston.com, J O E W E S T O N.com. Okay. I'll we'll put book. that in the show notes. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, I do online workshops, I do I have a uh, resilient power leadership program, a management program individual programs. I do, I do executive coaching. I give speech, uh, speeches and, and lectures mm -hmm. and seminars, but that, that website, I also have another website for the nonprofit fierce civility project and, uh, .org, another way to fierce get inside. Civility project .org. Yes. Yeah. Cause things do differ when you go to nonprofit versus for profits. Yes, absolutely. Do. So time flies when we're on the podcast. Teamwork is one of the most powerful tools any organization can have in today's workplace. And uh, it's great to talk to somebody like you who understands the aspects, the foundation of everything and thinking it beyond that. Appreciate your time on the podcast today. And uh, folks, if you like this, do check some of the other episodes out. We've got several other folks who have talked about neurodiversity. We got people who talked about leadership in different aspects all the way back. So check out the other episodes on the Teamwork Advantage. You know, folks, we can listen to the Teamwork Advantage. You're not alone. We've been downloaded in over 80 countries at this point. And the power behind that is incredible. Good news is, we know that you're not there. So go make today excellent and exciting. You're a member of the Teamwork Advantage. Until next time, take care. Take a great day. Bye-bye.